I'm, there's a million things going through here. I'm just going to let that go. First Peter chapter 5, talking a little bit about uh, uh, the devil and trying to give you some stuff as far as a character study is concerned uh, to give you a heads up. Now, I won't go back over everything that we've already covered uh, up to this point, but I am going to give you a few other things. And uh, one of the things I learned a long time ago from a guy who was, uh, I, I call him an operator, he was a special ops guy, he was, uh, uh, saw a lot of action and did a lot of, a lot of good things for the country and stuff. Uh, the, the real deal, the kind of people that you don't really um, hear a lot about or you don't see a whole lot of things about them, they're just kind of quiet and behind the scenes. They do their job and then they retire and you never even know what they did. But one of the things he said that, that uh, has always resonated with me uh, was the fact that he said, generally speaking, one of the biggest mistakes that we make even as operators is we underestimate our enemy. And he said, one of the things that you always want to keep in the back of your mind, whether it's a team sport or an individual sport or it happens to be at the time I was uh, still downtown, he said, is you, you never want to, no matter what you think in your mind about who it is, whether it's a hostage situation or whatever, he said, you never want to underestimate the power of your enemy. Now, there's something to think about there, because as a Christian, a lot of times what we wind up doing is we sort of mock the little laugh and we think of, you know, around uh, Halloween time, the devil as being a jack-o'-lantern or something like that and that, you know, he walks around in red flannel pajamas with a little pointy tail and a, you know, a trident and, you know, and, and uh, got some horns on his head and everybody kind of laughs at it. Oh, I think he likes the fact that you laugh. I think he likes being underestimated. Uh, but as sure as the Holy Spirit is in you and working in you because you're not your own, you're bought with a price, uh, the devil is interested in derailing you. And uh, even though you're saved, ladies and gentlemen, and your soul is safe, uh, your body can still be very much under attack of the devil. And I showed you those things already. They're important. But the Lord gives you a multitude of warnings. I'm going to show you some of those things here. And then I'm going to say this to you. The devil likes to deal with your emotions. He likes to deal with your feelings. He likes to deal with things that you can see. Uh, he show, tells you that in the tribulation period that the platform of the devil is signs and wonders and miracles. You say, why? Because you can see it. Amen. Well, I saw it. Well, I heard it. Well, I was there when it happened. Yeah, but how do you know which one it was? The Bible teaches you clearly that you can't sit at the table with the Lord and sit at the table with the devil at the same time. Well, it must be possible or he must not have said that to you. Now, you have to recognize this, that the devil has been studying mankind long before the first situation and all that. We won't get into all that now, but he's been studying mankind since Adam. He was in the garden when Adam showed up. And then when Eve was there, he waited until Eve was created out of the side of Adam. And then what he did was, is he appealed to that woman's uh, emotions. He didn't appeal to her with anything negative. Amen. He appealed to her and said, uh, hey, you considered that tree right there? It's good for food. Desire to make one wise. Why, you'll be as gods knowing both good and evil. Why wouldn't you want to be like that? What, negative? Eve didn't fall down like people make it out to be. Eve fell up. She, he, he promoted her. He said to her, you're being put down. You're being uh, belittled. You're not being, uh, reaching your capacity. Why didn't he approach Adam with that? Amen. Now, please, ma'am, don't get upset with me. Okay, just let me finish. But recognize that the Bible tells us as men, and he tells you as women, that you are the weaker vessel. Now, you can accept that or not. That's not just physical, and I know exceptions to every rule. I understand that there are women that are stronger than men. I've seen women do things that men are not capable of doing, like childbirth, not just because of the fact that you're actually gene genetically built to be able to do that, but you have a pain threshold. Women have a pain threshold men don't have. Uh, you'll tend to tolerate pain much better than men do. Uh, men get a hangnail, and they're going to be in bed for a week. Especially if they're married, that's how they wind up, you know, milk, milking it, you know, baby, I can't get nothing, hurts my thumb, I can't wash the dishes or whatever. 
and you deal with that stuff all the time. You're better at dealing with more graciously with kids. Men, men don't like to put up with that. Uh, your kid comes in and says, you know, I broke my finger and their fingers twisted around. Yeah, well, put a popsicle stick on it and some band-aids, let's go, you know. And mom will take them to the hospital and rightfully so, and get it x-rayed and get it taken care of. And, and then dad finds out you were an idiot because the finger was actually broke, not sprained. You know, and then his finger would have been twisted for the rest of his life if he had taken your advice. I know, men, you hate to admit that, don't you? You know, oh, it's just a cold, suck it up, you're fine. Then the kid's got 105 fever and you're down at the hospital, and the doctor says to you, why'd you wait so long to get here? Well, my husband said it was just the sniffles. <laughs> Haven't you learned not to listen to your husband, ma'am? <laughs> right? Now, you have to recognize that, ladies and gentlemen. You have to recognize that the devil, if this passage is right, he's a roaring lion. Look, if you will, please. Look in verse 9. I want you to get a hold of this thing before you get to the passage you're familiar with. Look in verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble." It's a setup. We're looking at the context. I'm in 1 Peter 5. Look at the context. It's about humility and submission. Who would have ever thought that submission would protect you? Could I ask you a question? If Eve had been in subjection to her husband, could the devil have tempted her? If she'd have said, hey, uh, listen, man, I got no business talking to you. It doesn't look right me standing here under a fruit tree talking to you. I don't know what in the cat hair you think I am, but I'm not one of them girls. I'm, I, if you want to talk to me, talk to my husband. Amen. You'd be living in a whole other world. Humble yourself. What is it that got her in trouble? Pride. I deserve more than I have. I'm not being treated right. I'm not being treated fairly. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. Little bitty skinny ones, big old fat ones. I'm going to go eat worms. Why? Because nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. Pride gets you. Pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. And what that says is, is you deserve better than you got. Okay. Well, you might want to talk to the Lord about that. Now watch what happens. He says this to you now in verse number six, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he, that he, God, may exalt you when? In due time, not your time. When he says it's ready. That's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard for you to wait for God to promote you? Don't you think that uh, you should have already been promoted? You're at work and don't you think you should already be the boss? I mean, you've been there six weeks. <laughs> What are they waiting on? <laughs> right? On. Don't you think you should be recognized all the time? What would you get quiet all of a sudden for? You know, the hardest thing to do, the hardest thing to do is to wait for Him to exalt you. And sometimes He doesn't exalt you till you get to the other side. Now watch. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. That's a strange place to put that verse. Why? He's aware that you want to be promoted. He's aware that you want to be recognized. He's aware that you struggle with pride. You know what he said? Give me those cares. I care for you. Tell me about it. He's not telling you don't do it. He's saying tell me about it. I'll help you with it. Talk to him about it. Uh, you're not being treated right, ma'am. Tell his boss. Literally, tell his boss. You, you're not the boss. Tell his boss. His boss will put something on him Ajax won't take off. Do they have that around anymore, Ajax? Yes. Dutch cleanser? Yes. That's the powdery blue stuff. Comet, do they still have that? Comet will make you vomit. <laughs> so get some Comet and vomit today or whatever. <laughs> All right, now the verse. Be sober. Be serious. Don't be messing around. Be vigilant. Pay attention. Why? Because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now what he tells you there is, is that you have an enemy and he tells you to be sober and to be vigilant and to pay attention. Why? Because he's looking to grab you when you least expect it. And lions will sneak up on you. I've told you the story when we were in uh, South Africa and we're down there. There's a double fence and so on and so forth. And I'm watching these 
white are these albino uh, lions over here and they're stretched way out up there and got their claws way up here like this, you know, and they're clawing the tree and stuff like that. And I was enamored with how big they were. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't even see him coming. I never heard him coming. A lion had worked his way all the way around through that tall grass and stuff, and then got almost right there to the, where the fence was and then roared. I screamed like a little girl. <laughs> I fell back on my hind end. Of course, everybody laughed, but it wasn't funny to me. I was thinking, he's coming through the fence. But the illustration is, is that I was so enamored at what was going on, the lion could have had me. While we were there, they said at another uh, park that they were there, they said all signs all over, don't get out of the car, don't get out of the car, don't get out of the car, don't get out of the car. That's like, uh, you know, people tell you what to do, but you always know better kind of a thing. Well, a little Japanese fellow got out. He saw a lion off in the distance, and he got out to get a better picture. And uh, in the newspaper, it said that while he was out there, unbeknownst to him, a lion came around and grabbed him by the head and drug him off into the bushes. And they asked the guy, you know, that was the guide, well, what did you do? He said, I didn't do anything. He's dead. What am I going to do? I'm not going in there and go get him. Yeah. I mean, the pride might be in there. Right. Right. Do you know what the pride is? That's the pack of lions yeah. called a pride. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Right. You say, what happened? Oh, I'm just taking a picture of the one over there. Yeah, but while you're so busy looking at that one over there, one snuck up on you and, and got you. All right, now watch. Whom resists steadfast? Who is that? The devil in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in you, the brethren that are in the world. Now, the devil has the ability to afflict you and to create and cause trouble for you. Come, if you will, please, over to the book of Ephesians. Now, I know some of you are new here, and I'm going to go back over this stuff because you've got this idea, greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. That's a true statement of fact, but it doesn't make you immune to attacks from the devil. As a matter of fact, you have to recognize your adversary, the devil, has been watching human beings for over 6,000 years, and nothing that you can do surprises him at all. Amen. He knows exactly how to get you. He knows exactly how to send the seducing spirits after you because he knows what trips your trigger. And sometimes what trips your trigger is not an enticement, something that might be pleasing to your flesh. Sometimes it's jealousy. Yes. Right. He uses jealousy a lot. Sometimes it's envy, sometimes it's strife, division, sometimes it's a malignancy of, of, of being uh, misaligned with individuals that the Lord wants you to be aligned with. Sometimes it's lack of forgiveness. The devil knows how to use those things. It's not just a forbidden piece of fruit, a grape on a tree or a vine, a vine tree. All right, now watch this. He says this in Ephesians chapter number 4. Uh, verse 22, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. By the way, after you got saved, the old man's still there. And he's still just as corrupt as he was as the day you got saved. <laughs> you got to try to harness him every time you turn around. You got to put him in a straight jacket. You say, why? The second you take one hand off, he will break and run, man, and he will, he'll, and then he'll apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't mean anything by it. You can't trust this flesh. Amen. Even your flesh. Amen. All right, now notice what he says here, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. It requires effort. Put away lying. Speak every man the truth of his neighbor and the members one with another. Put away lying. Why? Well, I already showed you already that the devil is the author of the lies and God's the author of truth. The devil's the author of confusion, not the Lord. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Scary verse. Neither give place to who? That's a saved man. How can I give place to the devil? Obviously by being angry, obviously by uh, lying, obviously by corrupt communication. Look in verse number 29. Now you think the preacher's hard on you about those kinds of things. You're opening the door up when you do those things. He said, but that which is good to the edifying. My mom used to have a saying. My mom's saying was this, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, then don't waste your words. That's good advice. You live in a day and time where people make a living off of running other people down. Yes, right. 
the news media is full of that stuff. If you're still watching all of that stuff, all they do is, is talk about everybody that's not doing what they think they ought to be doing. Now, you get enough negativity in that to float a battleship. And then he says this to you, minister grace to the hearers, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Look at what's listed in verse number 31. Bitterness, wrath, evil speaking, clamor, that's where you get claymore from, put away you with all malice. That's intentionally hurting somebody. Amen. That's when you sit down to type something or whatever, you're intentionally doing, knowing it's going to cause harm. Right. And you send a text, or how about if you don't, even, you don't send one, you're intentionally hurting somebody? And you say, what is that? That's the work of the devil. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. You won't like the last part of that verse there. You say, what is it? And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Whew, who likes that? <laughs> what good is it for you to forgive somebody that you already like? Does it really take any effort for you to forgive somebody you already like? Not hard for you to give your husband and wife, is it? And you have to live together in the same household. That's not too hard, is it? How about somebody you can't stand? That's a tough thing, isn't it? You say, what do you have to do? You have to have the grace of God help you with that. It's pleasing to God. It may not be pleasing to you. Yeah, but do you know what they did? I, I don't know what they did, but I bet I could guess. See, I can clear out a congregation without even having to yell or scream or call you names. How do you do on forgiveness? It's a command. It's not a suggestion. And be ye kind one to another. Why, Southerners, you should know how to be kind, can you? Don't you? Do you do it? I'm not talking about just being kind to people you like. That's easy kindness. That's reciprocal. I'm talking about being kind to people you don't like. You know, the ones that are ugly and their mama dresses them funny. Doesn't mean you have to have fellowship with them. You know what it says, though? Can you be kind to them? Can you be tender hearted? Tender hearted? Can you realize that you may be sitting around somebody right now this morning that's going through something that, but by the grace of God, they're even sitting here today? You say, in this congregation? In this congregation. People you deal with on a daily basis. You never know what's in their saddlebags. You don't know what's going on in their mind. All right, look at this thing in 2 Corinthians talking about uh, forgiveness now. I'm just talking about the tricks of the devil. I haven't gotten off of that yet. <laughs> now watch. You say, well, I'm better at forgiving. How if they don't forgive me? The issue is not whether they forgive you. The issue is, are you forgiving? Amen. See, you're looking for a reciprocal. Well, I'll forgive if she forgives. I'll forgive if he forgives. No, 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 no. You missed it. You missed it. Jesus Christ, when he forgave you, he forgave you. Now, I wouldn't forgive anybody any quicker or any more than the Lord forgave you. I wouldn't give them one ounce. Don't give them another inch of rope. But if the Lord has forgiven you of things that you knew when you did it were wrong and you did it anyway, and he forgave you and you ask him to forgive you, don't you expect him to? Why can't you do that with others? Amen. So because they keep doing it. Okay. Wow, does that picture resonate with you right now? I mean, I'm going to ask you a point blank question. Anybody in here claim the blood this week at all? Amen. Leave, your, leave your hands in up position if it's true. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Did you claim the blood for something you've done in the past before and had to ask him to forgive you again? Okay, well, if that's the case, don't you keep doing it? Okay, well, you, are you better than God? He keeps forgiving you. He keeps forgiving me. I'm not just putting it on you. I don't have it down pat. I got besetting sins. You say, what are they? They're none of your business. But the bottom line, it probably isn't whatever yours is. But the bottom line is, I know it. And I say, Lord, I did it again. I have a tendency to get too hard on myself sometimes. See, so you can't be too hard on yourself. Okay, well, maybe you can't, but sometimes I can. And then the Lord gets on me, and then I'm like, okay, you're right, Lord, you're right. Okay, I don't want to be arrogant, obnoxious. Yeah, well, you're going too far the other way. You need to find the balance. Yes, sir, Lord, yes, sir, Lord, I'll do that. I, I, I got it, I got it, I got it. Lord, it's me again. <laughs> Amen. 
Same thing again? Yes, sir. Well, just remember, as quick as I am to forgive you, how about being as quick to forgive others that do? Amen. Amen. That's the real testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. It ain't going to last forever, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever you're jacked up about right now, one day you're either going to die or you're going to wind up raptured out of here and it's going to cease to exist. So build a bridge and get over it. Amen. You say, what? The devil uses it, doesn't it? I have people that won't come to church here. You know why? Because I had the old preacher in. I have people that don't come to church here. You say, why? Somebody parked in their parking space. Somebody said something to their brat. I mean, their child. <laughs> uh, somebody, you know, actually posted something or did something and they were wrong in doing it, but what they posted was right. You know what they did? They kicked Jesus Christ to the curb and said, I'm done because of people. You better learn something, ladies and gentlemen. There's none of us perfect. And if you're here visiting and you think this is the perfect church, <laughs> thank you, you just joined it and ruined it. <laughs> the old preacher used to say, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because then it won't be perfect anymore. <laughs> I'm not making fun of you, ladies and gentlemen. None of us are perfect. That's you right. kind of hold the standard a little higher for other people than you do for yourself. Well, be realistic, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Yes. Every one of us have got enough fleas to remind us of the dog we are. Amen. And so when you get done wrong, don't throw in the towel. I mean, in another oh. few months here, you'll have more room to spread out where you won't feel so uncomfortable like you do now. You're about packed out in Sunday school now. But you get into a situation when you get over there, but you can't hide from the Lord. Amen. Get to a point where you're just quick to forgive. Let the cotton picking thing go. All right, watch this thing in 2 Corinthians now. This has to do with a guy who had an illicit uh, situation going on with his uh, stepmother. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 5. I'm not going to give you any more than that. But to, to let it suffice to say this, it's perverted. That's his dad's wife. All right, and then the Bible says this in verse number 7. So the contrary, as you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. I'm in 2 Corinthians 2, verse number 7. Unless perhaps one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Meaning the guy's tried to get right, and the guy's trying to do what's right to do. Um, but you won't, let him, you won't let him off the mat. He's not talking about pedophilia. They don't ever get off the mat. The repercussions of the sin they've committed will stay with them the rest of their life. That's not what he's talking about here. I don't care if you don't like that. Look at me like that if you, if you want to look at me. Well, can't the blood... For you? Sure, they can get forgiveness. I will never trust them. So what are you going to do? They're not welcome here. If you're a pedophile, you should leave now. But preacher, that's not very loving. I don't care what you think about that. Don't, don't make me the bad guy. You're the one that messed with the kid. You're the bad guy. And I don't trust you. Well, you're not very Christian. Okay, call me whatever you want on your way out the door. I don't, I don't care if you, 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 something's wrong with you if you feel different than that. There, there's something wrong with you. You must have something hidden somewhere. To condone that kind of thing. Romans 1, you know what it says? It says you're having pleasure in what they did. There's a zero tolerance for that. Yes, sir. I want to forgive you of all the other stuff and thank God for it and so on and so forth. But when it comes to that, and, and, I, and when it comes to this, I'll be arrogant enough to say, I did that stuff for a long period of time as far as an investigator is concerned, and I do know more than most of you know about it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm telling you now, it's not tolerated. Amen. Beyond perverted. I don't even, it, it anyway. Notice what the Bible says. Verse number 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Um, if you're thinking, well, I, if that's how he feels, I'm leaving. Oh, okay. I don't even know what to tell you. Oh, okay. But there's a lot of people in here that ain't. Well, I'm going to leave. You think everybody's going to follow you like little ducklings follow a duck? You know what they'll do? They'll wave at you on the way out. They say, oh, where were we, preacher? You, you ain't going to be the bride at the wedding here. Not when it comes to that. The Bible says this in verse number 10, to whom forgive anything, uh, forgive I also, I forgave it all. Uh, and for if I forgave anything, verse number 10, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes I forgave it in the person of Christ. 
Why? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Amen. Man, that should shake you to the core. You say, that's a saved individual in a church. An unforgiving spirit, the devil has a, a gateway into your heart. I could just preach a whole sermon on a lack of forgiveness. You say, well, what happened? Probably the altar would fill up. You say, why? That's the quickest way for the devil to get in a church. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians 6. We're talking about the devil. The devil knows how to appeal to your flesh. That's why when it comes to music... The devil is God's first music man. He's created with tabrets and pipes in him. I'm, I'm not foolish, ladies and gentlemen. I know that there's different kinds of music that trick or trigger. It causes the spinal fluid and it ain't all hard acid rock. And most of you people, especially you older ones, what you like is the golden oldies. It reminds you of a day when you were 15 or 16 years old doing things you had no business doing. Amen. Mind you, when you were younger and you were a mover and a shaker and, you know, you could, you know, you could, yeah, you were a Mr. Zoot Suiter and all that kind of stuff and that kind of a deal. Hey, I told you last week, you old, act old, okay? Stop acting your IQ, start acting your age. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world, man. I told you already, mirrors and yoga pants don't lie. Stop wearing them. Amen. You say what? You're old and you're, you're, you're uh, fluffy. <laughs> You're not a kid anymore. Amen. Nauseating to your kids and your grandkids to see you acting like a fool. Act like a grandma. If you're a grandma, I'm a grandma. Amen. You know, well, you know, stop talking about my age. You'd rather me talk about your IQ? <laughs> I'll just give you an idea. One of them's lower than the other. <laughs> I didn't say which one. Now, listen, it's time, you, it's time you grow up and recognize the days of your youth are gone. Okay, well, embrace being old. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. This is a tough one for you now. Look in verse number 11. We're talking about the devil. You Corinthians, our mouth is open to you and our heart is enlarged. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. Uh, you're not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now for recompense of the same, I speak unto you as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Paul called his converts his kids. He claimed uh, to be an instrument of their salvation. He calls Timothy his son in the faith. Now he didn't save him, but God used him as a human instrument to see him saved. God uses you to publish the gospel. He uses you as a mouthpiece to be able to do those things. Now here's what he's fixing to say to the here church at Corinth. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he with the believers with the infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you're the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell them and walk with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, stay with them and try to reach them and try to win them and do all you can to be around them and get to look like them and be a chameleon. That's what I say. <laughs> No, he says, come out from among him and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, the first thing I want you to recognize is, come to 1 Timothy 4, is if you're going to have any victory over the devil, you're going to have to learn that there are certain places you have to draw lines. Amen. Preacher, what are those lines? I don't think I have to tell you. You say, why? You have the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. The fact that you would argue over that says there's something wrong. The Holy Spirit's grieved. You know what's right. Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little hands what you touch. Be careful little ears what you hear. You remember that song? Yeah. <laughs> you know what that is? The Holy Spirit's in you. You know whether or not you're uh, inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Sure. You hear something. You won't tell me the Holy Spirit doesn't say to you, hey now, hey, hey, enough of that. Amen. Enough of that. I, you, I don't have to tell you what it is. Give you a list of all kinds of things because I'll leave something off the list. <laughs> Well, he, he never hit me today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm golden. Uh, your hands touch things they shouldn't touch. 
feet carry where they shouldn't carry it. You say, what are you doing? I'm giving you a story of the crucifixion. Nails in his hands. Why? My hands touch things they shouldn't touch. That's the old preacher. Nails on my feet. Why? They carried me places I shouldn't go. Oh, preacher, that's just ridiculous. No, it's not. It's perfectly spot on. You say, hold on the side. Why? My affections get me in trouble sometimes. Set your affections on things above, not on things below where moth and rust does corrupt. What happens? Right to the heart. Uh, 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 a band of thorns around my head. Why? My sins of intellect. I think I'm so smart. Nobody can tell me anything. Right? You say, what is that? You know what's right and wrong. Amen. You just get anesthetized to it. You don't have to have a preacher get up here and list you 50 things that you should and shouldn't do. You should know that. I give you that much credit. I think you have walking around sense. I think you know better than to go in certain places and look at certain materials. and do, I, I really believe that. You know when they sit down there and they put the fluted glass in front of you. You, you, know what it, you, you know what it is. You have an opportunity to say, you can go ahead and take those. I need more, more room on the table. I don't need to have that there. Well, wouldn't you like to have a little, we have a little uh, uh, red, we have white, we have a Chardonnay, we have a, a champagne. We'll, we'll just make it a virgin. We'll give you a Shirley Temple and all that. No, thank you. No, thank you. I wouldn't want to give anybody in here the impression I'm doing wrong. You say, what is that? I don't believe you ought to bend over and tie your shoelaces in somebody's watermelon patch. I don't think you ought to drink water out of a beer bottle. Now, some of you, you're, it don't bother you. Well, I'm not convicted by that. Okay, well, that's your business. I'm not doing it. They used to make uh, candied cigarettes. The, the companies used to make candied cigarettes. I made the mistake one time of buying a candied cigarettes from the grocery store across from the church up in Tennessee. Man, I'm glad our head didn't get in the way of my dad smacked that thing out of my hand. But I had it, had a little red tip on the end of it, you know, and I'm... <laughs> Son, I'm getting chills right now, and he's been dead 30 years, man. Man, I mean, I'm, I mean, you talk about getting my head handed to me. I don't know where you got that from. Then they made uh, cigars with a little have a tampa thing around it, and they were bubble gum. I was stupid enough to buy one. <laughs> one. I remember it. It was a greenish color. I thought I was going to turn green by the time he got done talking to me. You say, why? It's just bubble gum, preacher. No, it ain't. It's the impression. My daddy never let me have root beer. Oh, that preacher, nothing wrong with root beer. You ever look at the bottle they serve it in? No, I'm not, you do whatever you want to do. Oh, preacher, that's the most ridiculous thing. Yeah, somebody opens a refrigerator, just sees the word beer in a brown bottle there. They're not sure they don't think nothing of it. <laughs> but now see, I, maybe, I have, maybe I carry it a little bit too far. Maybe it's kind of like, well, preacher, you know, I think you're a little bit, you're a little legalistic. Well, I'd rather err on that side than to be a little bit too um, liberal in my theology. You get ready to go down by the water and all of a sudden you think you're at the house taking a bath. Well, now, preacher, you know, we live in Florida. I'm very much aware where we live. question you'd have to ask yourself is, is that, should you be down there? Sure, you should be down. Okay, help yourself, man. Don't you go swimming? Sure, I'll go swimming in three-piece suit. <laughs> <laughs> Put my Bible in a hefty bag and I... <laughs> Last time I went swimming, man, I mean, Greenpeace came running out and thought I'd escape from SeaWorld or something, man. <laughs> thought I was an albino or whatever. No, I'm, no, I don't... I'm not doing that. Come on. Now, if that's what you want to do, then that's fine. But count me out. Don't invite me to your pool party. Yeah. You say, why? I ain't coming. Right. You're going to get your feelings hurt. Right. So we're just, I'm not coming. Yeah. Right. We go to the youth camp and stuff like that. And when they have uh, games and things like that, they're fully clothed. They wear dark shirts right. and uh, shorts down below their knees. And preacher, that's just a little old-fashioned. Yeah, okay. Well, you... Come on, preacher. 
you're, you're, you're ignorant if you think I'm going to let a bunch of boys and girls whose hormones are bouncing off the ceiling run around out there. You, you think I'm that stupid? Not only that, I got a bunch of stinking old men around there. It ain't just the kids. Some of you men got enough backbone to amen it. The rest of you are like, oh, I would never. Then you must be queer. Something's wrong with you. You're just better to abstain. Listen, avoid it rather than try to resist it. I can handle it. You're an idiot. All right, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Aren't we, we're having a good time studying the devil, aren't we? Praise the Lord, man. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of? How about that? You say, what happens? It doesn't just come out of the news media. You know where it comes from? It comes right out of the pulpit. It's false doctrine. It's false teaching. You say, what do they, what do they get you? Uh, I'll show you a false doctrine here. Come to 2 Corinthians. I'll show you a false doctrine. It's right out of the Bible. Can I show it to you? I think I got enough time to at least cover part of it. Come to 2 Corinthians. Oh, let's see. Let's make it uh, 14. Make it 1 Corinthians 14. We'll hold off on that one. Come to 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians chapter number one, verse number 22 says, wherefore tongues are for a, not to them that believe, but to them that, and the Jews require a, and the Greeks seek after, how many Jews do I have in here right now? Oh, there's not any in here. Okay. Well, is it for you? Do you believe? Yes, sir. It's not for you then. He says for them that believe not. Should we go any further? No. Shouldn't have to. But you do. You say why? The devil wants to divide the church. Amen. You say with well, what? With something spiritual. Yes. Look in verse number 23. If therefore the whole church come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say, Are you mad? Well, see, that just makes common sense, doesn't it? Well, we're having service. Just jump in on it. I don't even know what's being said. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he's convinced of all and is judged of all. In other words, they can understand him. Prophesying is preaching. Now watch this saying, how is it, verse number 26, when you come together, one of you hath a psalm, one hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done to the edifying, right? Decently and in order, verse 40 says. All right, now watch. Let's just get the proper interpretation of the passage. Look in verse number 27. Go to the third word in the text. Who's doing the speaking? Can a woman speak in tongues? Well, are you sure? Let's see what the Bible says about it. Look in verse 34. What's the Bible say? What does the Bible... Come on now. The context is tongues. The Lord said, women, uh-uh. He then gives you three uh, things to understand. Now, now I'm, I'm, I know this already because it's already happened. I'm telling you, you're going to get upset with me. You say, why? Doctrines of devils. Yeah. Amen. Well, preacher, they're all in the room. They're waiting for the tongues to come sitting up, upon them as a mighty rushing wind. And they all spoke with, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. Are not these the twelve... Are not these the apostles? Everybody didn't speak in tongues. How heard we every man in our own language? Just gave you the interpretation of what it is. All right, now watch. Here comes the, the rules for this. Look this. If any man speak in an own tongue, let it be by two, at most by three, and that by course. That means one at a time. 
And that means unless there is an interpreter, if the passage is right, then you're to keep silent. That means if it were to be here, so that were to be if, uh, is Miss Bridget here? I don't see her here this morning. Okay. So if Miss Bridget were here, any of y'all speak German? Okay. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Nein, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Nur ein bisschen? What are you saying, preacher? I said, do you speak German even a little bit? But if there's not somebody to interpret, I have no business to it. You say, why? It didn't do you any good at all. You're thinking, what does all that mean? Does, it doesn't do anybody any good. You know what he said? Man speak, one interpret, one witness. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what he's saying and the interpretation he's given is correct. It stands to reason at least two of those three know the language he's speaking. The man speaking the language may not know the language, but the person hearing it and interpreting it is saying, yep, he's saying, do you know uh, German and can you speak even a little bit? Right. And then you know that it's the truth of the thing. See it done decently and in order. You know what he says in the passage? Otherwise, you don't say anything. You say, what's tongues, preacher? It is simply a way to convey the gospel and to confirm the word. And in Acts chapter number 2, those individuals heard Jews speak and they heard speak in other languages. They didn't understand. Why? These guys are speaking a language they didn't understand. How heard we every man in our own language. How dare you think that that gives you confirmation of anything? There's nowhere in the Bible that gives you confirmation of salvation. Salvation comes from the death, burial, and resurrection. Why do you think he follows it in 1 Corinthians 15, or right here in 1 Corinthians 15, with the gospel right behind it? To let you know it doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. And it had to do with the conveying of that. Uh, Corinth was a seaport and they had individuals that came through there at the time. And those individuals came through there. And the people that were there, they didn't know who was going to show up. And when they showed up, the Lord gave somebody an ability to speak in a language they could understand. And the individual says, hey, here's what he's saying. And the other person says, yeah, that's what he's saying. I know that language. He's speaking Chinese. He's speaking Japanese. He's speaking Spanish. You get this all messed up sometimes, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever considered this for a minute? Moses is talking with Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Is that right? Yes. What language were they speaking? Come on. You ever pause to think? They're speaking Egyptian. They're not speaking, Pharaoh's not speaking Hebrew. You know what happens when the Holy Spirit gives you that story? He gives it to you in Moses' native tongue in Hebrew. But Moses is speaking fluidly the language of an Egyptian because he's talking to an Egyptian. But the Lord doesn't write that in Egyptian. The Holy Spirit gives that to you as an interpretation by inspiration. And gives you what that thing is so you can read it in English. You're getting it third hand. Spoken in Egyptian, translated to Hebrew, and now put in English. Amen. By who? By the Holy Spirit. Amen. You say, well, sometimes, you know, the things are not inspired in the Old Testament. All that. Listen, you're not going to tell God how He's going to preserve His Word. Amen. He's going to preserve it in your King James Bible the way it's supposed to be preserved. And if you realize that, Amen. you know what you recognize? you got somebody up there looking out for you. Amen. You don't have to have a degree to understand that. It's English. Yes. What did it say in the original language? I don't know how to speak Hebrew. I told a friend of mine that I, when I was in Israel, I'm sitting there listening to two guys and they're giving orders because something was going on. My goodness, I didn't know if they were trying to hawk up something and get rid of it. or. But I mean, man, they are going. To, and I mean, they're talking as fast as I'm talking now. I didn't understand a word they said, but man, did people move when they talked. So what they say? I don't know. I even asked the Arabic guy that we were there with, and he was like, <laughs> and so I had to ask a Hebrew what the Hebrew was saying and tell me in English. You know what the Lord does? He put it down for you in a Bible. It's English. You've got to have some kind of scholarship for that. No, you don't. No, you don't. You have to have about a sixth grade education. I'll tell you a quick story. I know we need to break. We got a big full morning this morning. But uh, there's a lady up in uh, Carolina. I can't think of her name. I can see her face. 
And uh, she told the old preacher one time, I got the privilege of meeting her up there. She was a friend of Miss uh, Betty Payne's. Adrena Lynn would remember her. Uh, but anyway, she says, you know, uh, when I was coming up, you know, we always worked on the farm and everything, and we didn't ever have no time for much learning or nothing like that. And, and so I, I couldn't ever read nothing. And I just sat down and I just did the best I could to run my fingers across the, the Bible. And she said, you know, it's an amazing thing. I was able to read through the whole Bible and I now I know how to read. Who taught you how to read? She said, oh, I just read the Bible and I learned how to, li I learned how to read. Lord. Now you say, well, preacher, that just sounds ridiculous. Okay, well, you'd be stupid if you want to be. <laughs> that old woman, you know what she did? She sat on and God said, well, my words are so important to you. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll help you learn to read them. And she read them. And she can read as well as you can read. Preacher, that's ridiculous. No, those words mean something yes, to her. Yes, yes. They mean something to the one that wrote it. Amen. Now, why would you, why would you put that, that down? Right. Why wouldn't you just say, man, Lord, I sure appreciate you giving me. That's a blessing, man. That's really, that's, that's a blessing. I had a preacher friend of mine years and years and years and years ago, and uh, he had some real problems. He was dyslexic and a couple of other things. He had a real problem uh, when it come to reading, and he did not do well at all when it came to school. And he said, I really struggle with reading. I know if I'm ever going to be able to be a preacher, I'm going to have to learn about reading. And I said, okay. He said, well, what should I do? And I said, uh, go get you Alexander uh, Scorby. And back in those days, it was on a cassette tape. And I said, uh, start in Genesis 1. And I said, put on your headphones and sit down. And uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. I said, you listen, you follow it with your finger, and you learn to read. Yes, amen. Um, by the time he got to about uh, Deuteronomy or so, he was really beginning to pick it up. And he said, I'm able to read a little bit faster. I said, just keep practicing, just keep practicing. He didn't even know how to pronounce the words. By the time he got through with the Old Testament, he could read fluently. But preacher, you say, well, it took a little effort. Sure. But why wouldn't you be interested in uh, English language as much as you're interested in slang? Yeah. 